Hi everyone, thank you for attending this webinar that will be given by our extractables and leachables experts, Dr. Sophie Michel and Dr. Annelies Vertommen. They both have a lot of experience handling chemical characterization studies for medical devices. They also follow closely the changes in the ever-evolving field and are both members of the ISO 10993 committee. I now hand the microphone to my colleague, Annelies Vertomme. Thank you for the introduction, Catherine. You probably noticed that the revision of part 18 of the ISO 10993 series is now available as final draft and can be purchased from several websites. When looking at this final draft, you will immediately see there are quite some changes compared to the previous version. In this webinar, Sophie and I will highlight some of these changes and provide you some background. You might wonder why these changes were needed. Well, the new title of the revision already gives you a clue. This title is Chemical Characterization of Medical Device Materials Within a Risk Management Process. So, Sophie, can you explain where this risk management in the title is coming from? Yes, of course, Annelies. So, it all started with the release of the new 10993-1 in 2018, which really stated that getting chemical information from your medical device is the first preliminary stage in any biological evaluation. However, the current 10993-18 from 2005 was not detailed enough to allow a proper assessment of your medical device. So therefore, there was a clear need of having a new guideline which would really summarize the state-of-the-art approach of performing chemical characterization so that you can really evaluate the final safety of your medical device to the patient. So we can directly see that the previous guideline was of 17 pages, while actually this new guideline is of 79 pages. So it is obvious that there was a clear increase in content and that we now have a much detailed approach. So there is a major revision of the whole concept of chemical characterization. There is a broader definition of chemical characterization itself. There is the introduction of the concept of an analytical evaluation threshold, extractable testing and leachable testing, which are all coming from the pharmaceutical world. And there is clarification on the extraction procedures and analytical techniques to be used during chemical testing. So you say chemical testing. Would that mean that chemical testing is required in all cases? No, so that is not the idea of this guideline to ask you to perform extractable leachable testing in all cases. So that will be very clearly described at the beginning of the final draft. So in the first stage, you will have to understand your medical device. What is its configuration? How is it made? How will it be used by the patient? The idea is that you can evaluate at this stage if there is already a replicate on the market. If you can demonstrate that your medical device is equivalent to another medical device, then the assessment is complete and chemical characterization is performed. If you cannot do this, then you will have to go through a theoretical exercise. In this theoretical exercise, you will ask yourself, should my material completely degrade and be totally administered to the patient, would it still be safe from a toxicological perspective? If the answer to this question is yes, then the assessment is complete. If that is not the case, then you will need to proceed with extractable testing, which will be the first testing phase. At the end of this extractable testing, you will need to perform a toxicological assessment. If you can demonstrate that 
your medical device is safe at the extractable level, then the chemical characterization is complete. If that is not the case, then you will need to proceed with leachable testing. At the end of this second testing phase, you will have to perform a toxicological assessment. If, once again, your medical device is safe, then the assessment stops there. If it is not safe, then you will need to go through other considerations that we will not cover here because that are also not described in the final draft. But it's important to understand that this process is not one way in, one way out. So if you think that it will be best for you to start with extractable testing, the guideline allows you to do so. So you have liberty in the way you want to evaluate your medical device. So in the first step, you will have to establish the configuration and material composition of your medical device. And it will be described in paragraph 5.2 of the final draft. So at this stage, you will have to understand your medical device. What is its configuration? How will it be used? What is the intended purpose? And what is the clinical exposure? In other words, how many replicates of your medical device can be administered to the patient in one day? You will have to describe the material composition and understand the impact of your manufacturing process. In other words, which residues could stay on your medical device after manufacturing processing. You will have to also understand the impact of the terminal steps, for example, sterilization, packaging, and if it can be applicable to your medical device, shelf life too. So this is more an information gathering step, which would be, for example, covered in your biological evaluation plan. If at this stage you can demonstrate that there is already a replicate equivalent predicate device on the market, then the assessment is complete. If not, then you will need to proceed with step two. In this step two, you will assess the release of chemical in the worst case scenario, and this will be described in paragraph 5.4 of the final draft. So this will happen if the entire device, as defined in part one, will degrade. For example, that is obviously the case for biodegradable medical device. If you can demonstrate that should your medical device degrade, it will still be safe, then the assessment is complete. It's important to understand that when we speak about the entire medical device, we speak of the bulk material, for example, here, the PLLA stand, but also the potential residues from the manufacturing, the potential residues which could form after terminal steps, for example, sterilization process, and so on. If you cannot demonstrate your medical device will be safe, then you will need to proceed to extractable testing, which will be your first real testing phase. So before you proceed to extractable testing, the guidelines will really emphasize on the fact that you will need first to define an analytical evaluation threshold, and this will be described in paragraph 5.5 of the final draft. So, Sophie, when we look at the wordings analytical evaluation threshold, it means it's a threshold to evaluate the analytical results. But this requires first we know which analytical techniques have to be used and how an extractable study should be set up. Therefore, we will dig into this AT concept later on in this webinar, and we will first explain how to set up an extractable study. Absolutely. So let's focus on how to perform an extractable study. This will be described in paragraph 5.6 of the final draft. So there are first some general considerations that it's important to explain so that there can be clear understanding of what is extractable as compared to leachable study. So in an extractable study, you want to understand which chemicals can come out of your material using worst case conditions. You do not want to degrade your material because this was actually already normally performed in the theoretical exercise of step two. 
but you still want to use worst case extraction condition so to be certain that you picked all the potential compounds that could be delivered to the patient. And how do you do this? You do this by using several exaggeration factors. For example, you will incubate your material at a higher temperature than what it will face in reality. You are going to incubate it also for a longer time or you will use solvents which will be worst case as compared to what the medical device will see in real use. In a leachable study, you want to see which chemical will be delivered to the patient under real use condition. So there is no exaggeration factor in a leachable study. So therefore, in theory, leachable are a subset of extractable. And that is the reason why, if your medical device is already safe after extractable testing, you will not be required to perform a leachable study. So in an extractable study, you use condition of extraction that exaggerate patient exposure, but do not cause deleterious effect to the device. The final draft is also going to go over some general consideration as the fact, for example, that multiple extraction replicates as triplicate testing should be considered. For example, to evaluate the viability in composition in your medical device and to evaluate the viability in extraction process. And it will also mention that it will be specifically important for absorbable devices, in situ polymerizing device, and drug combination device. So the extraction condition to be used will also be very specified in this final draft. So it will depend on the medical device to be tested, in other words, for how long your medical device will contact the patient. If your medical device come in contact with the patient for a limited amount of time, it will be recommended to use simulated use extraction condition, which will be actually closer already to a leachable study. And another way to do it would be, but this will not be the primary preferred way, through an exaggerated extraction condition. If your medical device is coming into contact with the patient for a prolonged or a long-term amount of time, the recommended extraction condition will be exhaustive extraction and exaggerated condition will only be a credible alternative. So it's very important here to note that exhaustive extraction condition will be required for already prolonged medical device, which was not the case with the previous guideline. So the extraction solvent will also be recommended in this final draft. In the previous version, there was a lot of referral to part 12 sample preparation for all biocompatibility testing. Would it still be the case in this uh, final draft of part 18? So there will still be, to some extent, a referral to part 12, but it will be much less important. So the extraction solvents to be used will be described in Annex D.1 and in paragraph 5.6, and it will state that generally, for medical device, two solvents of different polarities should be used, a polar and an apolar one, which would be in line, actually, with part 12. It will also mention that for some authorities, as the FDA, free solvent will be needed for permanent devices, a polar, a semi-polar, and an apolar one. But it will also state that you should consider the use of your medical device. For example, is there interaction with specific solutions or drug products? If that is the case, then additional extraction solution must be needed. Is your medical device coming into indirect contact with the patient? If that is the case, then one single extraction solvent replicating the expected contacting field might be sufficient. For example, if your medical device is only going to be used with saline solution, 
in an indirect way, then there will be no need to extract it with an apolar solvent as exam. Finally, it will also be said that if the aim of the testing is to correlate chemical data to the result of biological testing, for example, if you had a fail in a biocompatibility test and you want to understand why, then specific solvents that simulate more closely biological fluids should be used, and these solvents will be given in the next D.5 of the final draft. So, the different analytical techniques to be used in an extractable study is also going to be described. And analysts, can you tell us exactly why using one single analytical technique would not be enough at an extractable level? Yes, I will explain this in the coming slides. But first, it's important to know the difference between a screening approach and a targeting approach. In a screening approach, as the word says, you are going to screen for every potential compound present in your extract. So what are you going to do? You are going to compare the profile of the extract of your medical device with a blank. And you're going to report, identify, and quantify every compound that's differentially present in the extract of your device and that's not present in the blank. On the other hand, you can also choose to follow a targeted approach. For example, if, if you specifically want to target phthalates for the requirement of the MDR to follow CMR, then you know, okay, I want to analyze, analyze phthalates so I can make a method which specifically analyzes these phthalates and you can go for a very low concentration and a very accurate concentration. But of course, if you then only look for phthalates, you will miss all the other compounds, so you will not have any information on the other compounds. So, as Sophie already explained, during production of a medical device, many different raw materials are used. There are many production steps, cleaning steps, sterilization steps. So, this will result in a large number of potential extractables. And it's very difficult to predict all the target compounds on the forehand. And as Sophia already said, the results of the extractable study will be used for an overall safety assessment and to assess the risk for the patient. So, only targeting expected compounds at the level of the extractable study could be a fatal error for patient safety as potential toxic compounds could be missed. Would that mean that you only need to use screening methods? No, but screening is becoming more and more important, as it's mentioned now 46 times in the FDs. But you could use targeted methods when you are looking for a limited set of compounds, for example, elements. There is a limited set of elements you need to target according to USP 232. The same is true for onions, which can be captured by ion chromatography. There is a limited set of onions you need to target. So there you can use really validated targeted methods. It's a whole different story for organic compounds because there is such a large population of organic compounds, ranging from very small to very large compounds, from polar to very apolar compounds. So therefore, it is advised to use at least three different analytical techniques. To capture the very small compounds, which are generally very volatile, it's advised to use headspace gas chromatography, then coupled to mass spectrometry for identification. Typical small compounds are monomer residues, solvent residues from production steps, residues from polymer treatments, and small polymer breakdown products. The mid-sized compounds, which are less volatile, are called semi-volatile organic compounds, and they are analyzed by gas chromatography methods. Typical compounds are lubricants, plasticizers, antioxidants, polymer degradation products, 
and solvents with an elevated boiling point. And then the largest group compounds, they are non-volatile organic compounds, and they have a larger molecular weight. Typical compounds are fillers, plasticizers, antioxidants, and anti-slip agents. And here you have the possibility to use two different ionization modes to capture compounds of different polarity. So compounds which have more an apolar nature that are being captured in the hexane extract or in the isopropanol extract, they are preferentially analyzed by APCI. Compounds which are captured in the aqueous extracts, they are preferentially analyzed by a method targeted for polar compounds, such as electrospray ionization. But the result of all those three techniques is a chromatogram. And on that chromatogram, all the compounds are separated based on the time they are coming off of the chromatography column. But then, of course, there is the question, which compounds are we going to report? And therefore, it was really needed to set a threshold above which you need to report, and this is the AT. There is also a clear definition in this new final draft of the AT. It is defined as the threshold below which the analyst does not need to identify or quantify leachables or extractables and report them for potential toxical, toxicological assessments. See Annex E. So there is a referral to Annex E. In other words, it's a threshold above which a detected compound should be reported, identified, and quantified for proper safety assessment. Okay, so I understand that there is this AET, which can help me to understand above which level I need to report, identify, and quantify compounds for proper safety assessment. But how do I exactly determine it? Is there a specific guideline for it? Yes, indeed, there were a lot of questions how to define this AT. So therefore, luckily, now it's stated that you should calculate the AT from a safety concern threshold, such as a toxicological threshold of concern. This SET is also defined in the final draft as a threshold below which a leachable or an extractable as a probable leachable has a dose so low that it presents a negligible safety concern from carcinogenic and non-carcinogenic toxic effects. And luckily, the ISO committee also published now in February this year a specific guidance to set or define the TTC for medical devices. It's the ISO 21726. In this guidance, you will find the appropriate TTC to use and to define your AET from. You will find this table, and there the daily intake of one constituent is specified according to the use of your medical device. If your medical device will only contacting a patient for maximum 30 days during a patient's lifetime, you can use a threshold of 120 micrograms a day. On the other extreme, when your medical device is contacting a patient for more than 10 years, you are forced to use the threshold of 1.5 micrograms per day. But be very careful because it's clearly stated in this ISO guideline that the, the TTC concept is not valid for biological endpoints such as cytotoxicity, irritation, sensitization, hemocompatibility, material mediated pyrogenicity, and for endpoints that look for local effects that occur in tissues at the site of contact between a medical device and the body. And of course, it also is not valid for devices that are analyzed according to the ISO 18562 series for the breathing gas pathway, as there there is a specific uh, threshold specified in this series itself. Also, the TTC 
does not apply for constituents that belong to the cohort of concern. And what exactly are these cohorts of concern? It is a set of compounds that have structural groups with such high potency that the intake, even at concentrations below the TTC, still pose a significant risk for patient safety. So, and luckily, there now is also a limited list of these cohorts of concern because it was also or always a question that we get which are the cohorts of concern. So now there is a list given in this ISO guideline. And also in Annex E6 of Part 18, it's mentioned that some colorants have also the potential to raise concern and should be considered for exclusion from the analytical evaluation threshold. So what should you do then? As Sophie already mentioned in the beginning of this webinar, you should go and ask your supplier and people in manufacturing whether these cohorts of concern could be present. If not, the TTC concept can be applied. If there is data that suggests they could be present, then you still can apply the TTC concept to calculate your analytical evaluation threshold to screen for all potential compounds present in your extract. On the other hand, you should then target the cohort of concern at the concentration below the AT. So that is clear from what you just explained, Annelise, that we have to start from ISO 21726 to actually define the TTC which is applicable to a medical device. But this TTC will be in microgram per day, so how can we translate it into an analytical evaluation threshold which needs to be in microgram per liter in practice? Yeah, I believe to make it clear, it's best to, to take an example to explain it. So first, you should know the type of your device, but you already know it when you define the TTC. What's also important is to know your extraction ratio you are going to use during um, your extractable study. So the number of devices that is extracted in a certain extraction volume and the uncertainty of analytical methods. So what is this uncertainty factor? It is applied to account for the analytical uncertainty of screening methods, which are used to determine the extractable concentration. And it should be determined by the testing laboratory based on an in-depth analysis of the response factor in the library for each analytical technique. So let's look at this example. It's a permanent implant. So you should start from a TTC of 1.5 micrograms per day. Two devices can contact a patient in a day. Let's say one device is extracted in 50 ml and a certainty factor is two. So the use of 1.5 micrograms per day is in line with FDA and ISO 21562. But in the final draft, there is also mention that if the device was extracted till exhaustive, so that means you have demonstrated that you have extracted all the potential compounds that can come out of the medical device and your extraction is just exhaustive, then you can use 120 micrograms per day. To our knowledge, it's not yet in line with what FDA is expecting. Then you just fill in all the numbers, so you will divide 1.5 micrograms per day by the number of devices used in one day, and the extraction volume per device and uncertainty factor, and then you reach your final analytical evaluation threshold. In this case, 7.5 micrograms per liter. And this is exactly where you are going to draw the line on your chromatogram. So in this case, you will draw the line on 7.5 micrograms per liter. It will yield eight compounds to report. 
but then the next steps will be to identify and quantify these eight compounds. So it's important that you have a confidential identification. And Sophie, I think you will explain it in, into more detail in the coming slides. Indeed, Annelise. So actually, once you have defined which compounds should be reported, you will have to report them with a very clear identification level. And this identification level will have to be defined by your testing laboratory. And basically, it should represent how confident your testing laboratory is with the identification which is provided in the report. So therefore, that is, of course, very key information for the future toxicological assessment. So the final draft is going to ask you to have identification levels for each compound reported. They will give some examples, but they will not go in much detail. But we can see that the identification levels which will be provided in the final draft will be more or less equivalent to the identification levels which are described in USP 1663. So in USP 1663, there is four identification levels which are provided, which reflect the increasing certainty that the identification of a compound is correct. So it goes basically from unidentified compound, where you cannot say anything about the compound, to a confirmed identity, which is the highest level of confidence you can have in the identification that you provided in the chemical characterization report. So how do you get a confirmed identity where your testing lab is actually stating that is 100% sure of the correct identification? For this purpose, your testing laboratory needs to have developed its own internal library. It needs to have purchased analytical authentic standards of high purity and have injected them in its different analytical platform. For each of the analytical standards injected, it will have to have recorded its elution time on the chromatogram called a retention time and the very signature mass spectra of the compound. So a confirmed identity in USP 1663 is actually what we call an identified compound at Nelson Lab. For this purpose, we injected different analytical standards in our techniques, we recorded their retention time, their mass spectra, and we did this for our three different analytical screening techniques, so volatile, semi-volatile, and non-volatile compounds. So if you are looking for volatile or semi-volatile compounds, you can have commercially available libraries. So it can be that your testing laboratory decided to not develop its own internal library, but to only rely on external commercially available library. But it's important to understand that if he made this choice, he will be in the able to provide you with some identity level but not with a confirmed identity, because for a confirmed identity, you need a match between a retention time and a mass spectra, and this commercially available library only provides a mass spectra. Nevertheless, it can be that you decide that it will be already enough for your evaluation of your material. However, it's a completely different story if you're looking for non-volatile organic compounds, because for non-volatile organic compounds, there is simply no commercially available library. So you can only rely on your own internal library. And that is the reason why, for example, at Nelson Labs, we have injected 2,000 compounds. So that means that in practice, if we perform an extraction of your medical device, we can identify 2,000 compounds with a confirmed level of identity for which we know 
that the identification is correct. So there will also be in the final draft different level of quantification which will be uh, described. So if you have your own internal library, you also can have access to the relative response factor of each of the analytical standards which were injected in the machine. You see here, it's called a relative response factor. So the, there is a relative, so that means you are going to compare your standard with something else. Or why is it called relative? So it's important to understand that for every analytical run that we do, we always spike an internal standard at a known concentration. So there are two ways of performing quantifications. So you can work in the ideal world. In the ideal world, you will say that every compound has a, is equally sensible to an analytical technique. For example, if I spike the analytic, the internal standard at a certain concentration, and I detect an extractable at the same response than my internal standard, I will say that this extractable has the same concentration than the internal standard. And this is what we call relative response factor one. However, we know that this is now how it works. So actually, some compound will have different sensibility to different techniques. For example, if you spike an authentic standard at the same concentration than your internal standard, it can be that you will only get half of the response than your internal standard. Then you will know that the reference, the relative response factor of this authentic standard as compared to your internal standard is of 0.5. But you can also be in a different situation. So it can be that you will have a very sensible compound to a specific technique, and then you will spike it at the same concentration than your internal standard. You will get twice the response. In that case, you will say that the relative response factor of this authentic standard is of 2 as compared to the internal standard. So how to use this in practice? So there will be different quantification level, as I already said, which will be provided in this final draft. One way first to do it will be through estimated quantitative analysis, where you consider more the ideal situation in which every compound is equally sensible to an analytical technique. So let's imagine I have a chromatogram I detect an extractable at the same concentration, at the same response than the internal standard, and I know at which concentration I spiked the internal standard, in that case 10 milligram per liter, then I will say that this extractable is present at 10 milligram per liter. But we can do better. And one better way to do it is to consider the sensibility of each compound to the analytical technique. This will be called semi-quantitative analysis. And one way to do semi-quantitative analysis is through the use of individually RRF correction. So let's face ourselves in the exact same situation than before. We detected an extractable with the same response than the internal standard. So we would be tempted to say that this extractable is present at 10 milligrams per liter, but we will not say this because in practice, we already spiked this extractable as an authentic standard in the past. And we saw that when this, extra, this authentic standard was spiked at the same concentration than the internal standard, we were only going to get one third of the response. So therefore, we can say that the relative response factor of this authentic standard as compared to the internal standard is of 0.3. And in this extractable study, we now detected this extractable compound at the same response than the internal standard. It has to mean that this extractable compound is present 
actually at 30 milligrams per liter, so three times more than the internal standard. So this is, of course, semi-quantitative analysis, a very important way to perform quantification if you think that the data will be used later on to perform a proper safety assessment of patient safety. The advantage of using semi-quantitative analysis via individual RF correction is that there is no need to use high uncertainty factor or no need for more quantitative methods because actually you are already performing a very accurate quantification for all the compounds which are in your library. So there will be another way to achieve semi-quantitative analysis uh, and to determine the concentration of the compounds that will be through the use of surrogate compounds. And these surrogate compounds, what are they specifically? So that uh, a set of compounds with similar chemical structures at the extractable that need to be quantified in the extract. So in practice, you will spike these surrogate compounds to your extract. You are going to run them on the analytical machine. And at the end of the analysis, you will be able to calculate their recovery or their relative response factor based on the difference between the spiked concentration and the calculated concentration. The idea is that for all the other extractables which will be detected in this extract, you perform an extrapolated quantification. How do you do this? You will look at each of the extractable one by one, and you will try to define from which surrogate compound it is the closest. It can be in polarity or it can be in mass, for example. Um, and then you will use the RRF of the appropriate surrogate to correct the concentration of the extractable. But of course, that means that this surrogate should represent a broad range of chemical polarities because you simply do not expect the same extractable to be present in a polar and an apolar extract. So let's compare both approaches. With the RRF approach, you will have more accurate quantification because each compound is individually corrected with its own individually recorded RRF. And the RRF correction will be automatically be done by the software. But of course, one of the limitations is that validation is not possible for every compound, especially if you have a very extensive library. With the surrogate approach, you will only have an accurate quantification for a limited number of surrogates. For the whole population of the extractable, which will be detected in your extract, you will have to perform an extrapolated quantification. But of course, it has its own limits because we know that compounds can structurally differ from the surrogate and so have significantly different response. At the end of the analysis, you will also need to define the most appropriate surrogate for each of the identified extractable, which will be actually a very time consuming process, especially if you have a lot of extractable detected. But one of the advantages is that validation is possible for the set of surrogate compounds. So at the end of this extractable study, you will have to perform a toxicological assessment as per ISO 10993-17. We know there are also changes coming for part 17. Can you already tell something about it, Sophie? Yes. So actually, the experts are still discussing on the content of the final draft. But nevertheless, we know that it will go into the direction that a confirmed identification and semi-quantitative analysis and quantification, at least, will be important to produce a reliable toxicological assessment. At this stage, it can be that if you have unidentified compound or if you have a margin of safety which will be close to one, it will be difficult to assess the safety of your product. 
in that case, maybe improved identification will be needed. For example, by gathering data from your supplier or from your manufacturing process to try to identify further the compounds detected, or through the use of more powerful analytical techniques, that's what we call in-house second pass testing, for example. But it can also be that you will have to proceed to a leachable study. It's, by the way, very important to note that for certain applications as drug device combination products, the authority might always require leachable testing, whatever the outcome of the safety assessment at the end of the extractable study is. There were clear guidances given to, for the setup of an extractable study in his final draft. Is it also the case uh, for a leachable study? So is there specified how you should perform a leachable study? So the way to perform a leachable study will be described in paragraph 5.8 of the final draft, but there is not going to be much specification on how you should do this and why, because it is very case-to-case -case dependent on the medical device to, um, to assess. Of course, if you want to test an implant under a real use condition, you're absolutely not going to have the same setup than if you want to test an indirect medical device, which will be used, for example, with only one very specific solution. But nevertheless, what is very clear from this paragraph is that when performing a leachable study, you will have to simulate real use conditions. So how can you do this? By selecting a simulation solvent, by performing the incubation at a realistic temperature, for example, room or body temperature, and by following the migration of the target compounds using multiple time points. So what are target compounds? Then if you perform an extractable study, you will have determined the margin of safety for each of the detected compounds. And it can be, for example, in, in, in this case, that DHP presents a margin of safety below one, but n non -an above one. In that case, only DHP will still present a risk to the patient and will have to be followed in the leachable study. But because you know which compounds you have to look for in this leachable study, you will be able to use compounds using more quantitative or validated methods. If at the end of your leachable study, you can demonstrate that the exposure is acceptable, then the assessment is complete. If that is not the case, then further biological testing or mitigation will be needed. So in conclusion, let's summarize the key aspects that we covered in this webinar. So in the first stage, you will have to define your medical device, material of composition, how it will be used, understand the manufacturing process, and the poss possible effects of processing steps as sterilization. When you do not have sufficient information and you will need analytical testing, you need to perform and set up your extractable study in a way that it represents the worst case chemical release to the patient in order to perform a proper safety assessment afterwards. You will need to screen as broad as possible using a whole set of analytical techniques. If you defined in a preliminary stage where there could be court of concern compounds, you will need to look for them using specific techniques, for example, via a targeting approach. Then you need to calculate the analytical evaluation threshold that should be reached in the extractable study, since this threshold defines which compound you have to report, identify, and quantify. And to calculate this analytical evaluation threshold, you can start from the TTC, which is described in ISO 21726. At the end of the extractable study, you will need to perform a toxicological assessment according to ISO 
If you have unidentified compounds, you will probably have to use high-end equipment to have a better identification. And if your margin of safety is below one, then you will need to perform a leachable study that will simulate the real use condition and give more quantitative results. With this being said, Sophie and I would like to thank you for attending this webinar. We hope this webinar was useful and provided you some helpful guidance. If you're looking for more detailed information, you can always contact us via the email displayed on the screen or visit our website.